and shop the final days of Spring Fest at Lowe's. Right now, get an additional $300 off when you spend $1,996 or more on select major kitchen appliances. And keep your lawn looking fresh with savings on the Ego 15-inch string trimmer. It was $219, now it's $199. Shop Spring Fest today because Lowe's knows spring. Lowe's knows home improvement. Bow to 426. Selection varies by location. While supplies last. Exclusions apply. See Lowe's.com for details. It's the SNL Hall of Fame podcast. With your host, Jamie Dew. Chief Librarian, Thomas Senna. Matt Ardill. And now, curator of the hall, Jamie Dew. All right. Bring down those horns. Fade it out just nicely there. It's JD here, and uh, it's great to be back with you in the SNL Hall of Fame. Before you go any further, though, could you please wipe your feet? Because we're trying to keep it, you know, neat and tidy around here. The SNL Hall of Fame is a weekly affair. Each episode, we take a deep dive into the career of a former cast member, host, musical guest, or writer, and add them to the ballot for your consideration. Once the nominations have been announced, we turn to you, the listener, to vote for the most deserving and help determine who will be enshrined for perpetuity inside the hall. This week on the show, we have a fascinating topic. Uh, doesn't really fit neatly into one of the four categories, but uh, will be nominated in the writer category, and that is Herb Sargent. Uh, I'm very curious to hear what uh, Thomas's conversation with John Schneider sounds like. But before we get into that, why don't we slide over into Matt's Minutia Minute to learn a little bit more about Mr. Sargent. Oh, Matt, how are you doing today? Hey, Jamie. Uh, back. Thanks for having me again. How are you doing? I'm great. And how about yourself, my friend? I'm doing great. Um, today we got Herb Sargent. This was a tough one. Yeah, I bet. He was kind of a secretive man. Um, Interesting. He was born July 15th, 1923, nine years as a writer. Don't know his height. First time that's happened. What? Uh, he was born in Philadelphia and is the older brother of Academy Award winning screenwriter Alvin Sargent. He studied architecture at Penn State before joining the U.S. Army Air Force's Air Transport Command, serving in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Upon return, he moved to Los Angeles and graduated from UCLA. He got his start in radio in New York City before jumping to television to help develop the Steve Allen Show, as well as The Tonight Show, and specials for Petula Clark, Perry Como, Bing Crosby, Milton Berle, Sammy Davis Jr., Lily Tomlin, Paul McCartney, Anne Bancroft, and Burt Baccarat. That is an impressive resume. Um, I mean, these are classic acts that I even know about. I mean, I was, they were all old when I was born. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, 46 writing credits and nine producer credits. He won me six Emmys six Writers Guild of America awards, and was president of the Writers Guild of America East. His last project was the 75th anniversary special for NBC television. He shares one Emmy with Richard Pryor, and that is for one of those specials, uh, the Lily Tomlin special. The Writers Guild of America went on to name an award, the Herb Sargent Awards for Comedy Excellence, which is presented annually and was presented to Tina Fey in 2018. Conan O'Brien once asked Herb Sargent what the funniest thing he ever saw was, and Herb immediately replied, Martin Lewis, 1940s, in a club. Cool. And I have to say, as a comedy nerd, yeah. that's a show that I would travel back in time to see. Oh my God, that would be spectacular, right? Thank you for having me, uh, and have a great day. 
You too, buddy. All right, let's go to Thomas and John Schneider and learn some more about Herb Sargent. Yes, thank you so much. I am here joined by John Schneider. He's what I consider probably the Lorne Michaels of the Saturday Night Network, the booming Saturday Night Network. Lorne Michaels, but on the air more than Lorne Michaels is. But that's he, he takes on double duty as like the Lorne Michaels of the SNN and like the main on-air personality. Over the last few months, John has had like Bobby Moynihan, Paul Schaefer, Denny Dillon, recently Daryl Hammond on the SNN's SNL stories. So he's not big timing us. I'm just so happy that he's like still coming on our show. He's <laughs> he's reaching the big time. So John Schneider, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, wow. Thank you. That What an intro. I mean, I guess I'm going to have to see if the Beatles will join us next and then I'll probably stop appearing as much, but, uh, you know, yeah, to fulfill we'll, my Lorne Michaels legacy. The offer's still out there for Paul McCartney to uh, and Ringo Starr to join us. So, yeah, anytime. But we're, ha- we're so happy to have you. You've been such a great guest and supporter of this podcast. Well, let me just say, Thomas, I'm very thankful to be here, by the way. I, I Like you said, supporter of the podcast. I am a huge fan of all of you, of Jamie, of Matt, of Thomas. Like, you're doing incredible job, especially in uh, this, you know, you broke this year up into two different seasons. And I love the ideas that you're doing, um, but how you're continuing to pitch this. And I hope that all the listeners who are listening, uh, don't just listen, you also have to vote. So I am a huge supporter. And I believe that the SNL Hall of Fame is a great like addendum or, or, you know, great partnership with everything we're doing at the SNN. So uh, I'm so proud of all of you and your growth and hope it continues. Thank you so much for saying that. I mean, likewise, it's been a really nice partnership. Uh, we've poached some of your guests too. Like, I think I, I, I hear, often hear your podcast and I'm like, hmm, that person did a good job. So then I might reach out to them for something. So, uh, so yeah, so it's been, it's been a nice partnership here and that, that really means a lot. Thank you so much. And we have right. had a lot of voters actually, like for season two, there are quite a few people that voted. So we actually had a big sample size of votes. And by the way, you were on in season two for the Kristen Wiig episode and she is now an SNL Hall of Famer. And okay. yeah, totally because of you. You want to take credit for that? Sure. Yeah, that's that's all me. Uh, Kristen, you know, she's pretty good on the show, but uh, John definitely put her over the edge. I, I'd like to think so. So, and as I've told other guests, like I can't prove that your case didn't put her over the edge, right? You can't right. prove that negative. So just go ahead and take the credit. Congratulations, Kristen. And congratulations, John, for Kristen being in the SNL Hall of Fame. <laughs> Yeah, as Penelope would say, uh, I'm the greatest Hall of Famer and uh, nobody else can beat me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, so today, Herb Sargent. So far, speaking of you know previous uh, SNL Hall of Fame results, we've had two writers inducted into the SNL Hall of Fame, being Tina Fey and Seth Meyers. And there's a, kind of a caveat to that, I think, is they're both, they were both high profile performers as well as writers. I think that helped them out quite a bit. So just in general, like, can you speak on why it's been tough for writers, in your opinion, to break through in terms of recognition? Sure. I mean, it's a really big shame, I would say. Uh, And uh, we love everybody who's voting for the Hall of Fame and we want more voters. But I think that you're doing a little bit of a disservice to the show if you're not at least considering putting some of the writers on your ballot. I mean, look, when I was younger and I was just getting into Saturday Night Live and then slowly became more and more obsessed with the show... I still probably didn't really consider about who wrote each sketch. Like some of the writers were a little bit more well known than others. But if you're coming to seek an SNL podcast, you're probably at the level of fandom where you're ready to accept that, you know, the people who are performing the sketches on screen didn't come to those ideas themselves. And there is a process uh, to develop the sketches. Some of the greatest sketches of all time have multiple people to credit them for. So I think if you're interested in Saturday Night Live in its full capacity, you should be interested in the writers who helped create those sketches. So I would hope that people would consider honoring them. And I think as we get through the backlog of the greatest stars in the history of the show, I would hope that would open up some room for potentially a few of these 
writers to get in, and we'll talk about why Herb maybe should be one of them today. I would hope that, as you said, there is a backlog of heavy hitters. I kind of liken it, Jamie and I have likened this to the Baseball Hall of Fame. I know you're a baseball fan. They didn't start the Baseball Hall of Fame until maybe the late 30s, so you had a backlog of like Babe Ruth and Honus Wagner and Ty Cobb and some of those people. But once you put them in, then that made room for other deserving people that maybe weren't as big a household names. And I'm hoping this happens. Like we have Jack Handy, who I think is a great candidate, Franken and Davis, who did a lot for the show as partners, of course. John and I, you you and I have preached about the Lonely Island, and I don't want to open that whole can of worms right now. We've said our piece on the Lonely Island, but they should be in the SNL Hall of Fame. I think they will be, but hopefully our voters and listeners have a chance over the coming months to really get to know these writers. So as far as Herb Sargent goes, like what was it about him that made you want to educate SNL fans about his time on the show? Yeah, I mean, look, you talked about Babe Ruth and Honus Wagner. I mean, we're talking about uh, people from a very old era of the show. And, um, you I know, Herb might have watched them play baseball. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Herb was born um, almost 100 years ago, uh, believe it or not. So uh, he is an OG. And I think what's most interesting about him is like when you're really trying to figure out, like, how did this whole thing come together? The 50 year, almost 50 year institution of Saturday Night Live. Well, way back in the beginning of the show, you know, a bunch of 20 and 30 somethings who were extremely talented all got together and started putting out sketches and becoming, you know, not ready for primetime players, but eventually celebrities. And there was one person who was with them who was a little bit older and more experienced in the entertainment industry, who basically guided everyone, including Lauren Michaels, through those original days. And that was Herb Sargent. So, you know, last year, you guys at the SNL Hall of Fame honored Lauren Michaels with like an honorary pass into the Hall of Fame. I think Herb is like right up there. He should be considered for this because he used such an important presence in those early days of the show and really through the first 20 years, his uh, footprints all over the show. Yeah, Herb was 52 when SNL premiered <laughs> in 1975. So Lorne and Dick Ebersol, so they made it a point to hire a young staff when they were getting the show up and running. That was everybody from writers to cast to PAs on the show. Lorne and Dick Ebersol wanted people in their 20s on the show. But like I said, Herb was 52 <laughs> when the show premiered. He was the elder statesman. So do you think that perspective like of being an older person was needed for that, that show and that group of writers? Absolutely. I mean, think about the writers. You know, it, it was a small group of writers. Now we have like 20 to 30, potentially, including Weekend Update writers that work on the show. But back then it was like maybe 10 max, including Lauren himself and Ann Beats, 28, Tom Davis, 20, Al Franken, 24. Lauren was 31. Marilyn Suzanne Miller, 25. Michael Donahue, 35, was probably the closest to Herb. Rosie Schuster, 25. Alan Zweibel, 25. I mean, the, these, like I said, 20s and 30s, they were all like partying, going out. I mean, you hear about the original days of the show, like, you know, the late night parties that they would have. Um, they needed it in a way like a little bit of a father figure to help guide them and help them write sketches. You know, today for the show, basically, you know, Thomas often when he invites guests on the show, asks them to think of sketches that writers wrote or cast members participated in. In this case, because Herb has his fingerprints over so much, for me, it was actually more important to find anecdotes and things that people said about him. So what I'd like to do with you, Thomas, is sort of share some background from some of the people who were with him at the time, some things that I found that would probably give some insight into Herb. Yeah, yeah, please. I'm super curious about that. Yeah, sure. So let me start with uh, Tom Davis, who basically one of the great writers who's no longer with us as well. And, uh, uh, you know, famously, uh, Franken and Davis, who are up for the SNL Hall of Fame. But Tom Davis talks about the last week of July 1975. He says that Al Franken and him were offered a six week contract. OK, imagine that six weeks for the position of writer at minimum wage. In those days, you could pay a team as one writer. So they were paid together for a yet unnamed live comedy show to be broadcast from Rockefeller Plaza. When they arrived from California, Tom had long hair and said things like far out. <laughs> this lasted only a week in the new environment because he remembers a great conversation between Herb and Michael O'Donohue talking about the New York Times and the New York Post and what the difference was. And uh, Tom was like, well, what's, what, what's really the difference between the Times and the Post? And O'Donohue was so upset 
upset and was like, who are these idiots that are coming here from California? But Herb held up his hand and said, so, so what if he doesn't know? And Herb took Tom Davis under his wing and helped him get some sketches on the air. Uh, Tom Davis talks about how on the fourth show, Franken and Davis got their first sketch on the air and it was Herb who pushed them to get their show on the air. It featured Chevy as a young Texas serial murderer who has one phone call home to his parents, played by Jane Curtin and Dan Aykroyd, who support their son no matter what. Tom says it wasn't a great piece, but Herb pushed them. And then you think about how many pieces Tom Davis and Al Franken got on the show. I mean, that's Herb Sargent who really helped guide these two people. Yeah, it's interesting to me that in the anecdote that you just shared that Michael O'Donohue was one of the main kind of characters in that anecdote because he probably he and a lot of other people involved with the show at that time fancied themselves as mavericks, you know, as edgy mavericks. But I think that wouldn't have worked unless you had a steady hand like Herb Sargent. And he, Herb Sargent showed, like, Michael O'Donoghue was ready to just write off Franken and Davis, but you needed that steady hand, somebody with experience to know, like, no, don't just write them off. Like, we have to, we're here to help help them. We're here to guide them. We're here to share the writer's voices as well as our ours. And I think that takes experience. And I know Donahue had a little bit of experience, but not like Herb's. He was, I mean, you have his back. I know he was involved in a couple of really big shows at least and among other things. So like just briefly before we go on to the next, like, can you sure. share with the audience like Herb's background and his experience before SNL? Sure. Well, let me start by saying he served in the Army Air Forces during World War II. So imagine that. I mean, he was serving during World War II. He was born in Philadelphia, ended up moving to L.A. and going to UCLA. And then he moved back to New York to work in a radio originally and then moved on to television. In 1956, NBC on Sunday nights created the Steve Allen Show. Most people know Steve Allen for being the original head of The Tonight Show. And they basically wanted to go up against Ed Sullivan and... Herb Sargent was one of the original writers on the Steve Allen show, and he propelled that to working a little bit with Carson and then specials for Bing Crosby, Milton Berle, Sammy Davis Jr., Lily Tomlin, Paul McCartney, Burt Bacharach, like a lot of famous musicians and actors and celebrities. He was entrusted with being like one of the guys who was like in there and knew how to write comedy specials. Eventually, he'll be, he'll be the Writers Guild of America president in the East. And, you know, that's a very big deal. He's an award named after him because of that. But uh, yeah, he's like one of the OGs. I think he was the first head writer on Johnny Carson's Tonight Show, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, those credentials that you just mentioned, I don't know that the show may have may have imploded upon itself if they didn't have adults in the room <laughs> like right. Herb Sargent in those early years. I can't imagine giving somebody like Michael O'Donohue as much reverence as a lot of us maybe have for his time at SNL, but giving him like total free reign or his voice total free reign on SNL. I can't imagine if it would have lasted as long as it did. For sure. I would love to read an anecdote from Lauren Michaels about Herb Sargent because basically like it's a good transition point into how Lauren brought Herb onto the show. So, you know, after Herb passed, Lauren wrote this and Lauren said, when I think of Herb Sargent, I think of the New York that I fell in love with when I moved here. He was sophisticated, kind and gentle, but with a real sense of how the world worked and of New York City where anything could happen. So, you know, just picture yourself at the start of the show, this new venture, like people don't know what SNL is going to be like. And Herb is there to sort of settle everything because he understands the city and celebrity culture. So Lauren says, when I first met Herb, I was working on a special for CBS with Lily Tomlin. And I was a writer and Herb was brought on to be a producer. And all Lauren knew about Herb was that he was this legendary New York writer. And, you know, that's where he got to know him. And he was funny and kind and encouraging to Lauren. Uh, Lauren didn't really understand how network television worked, but Herb was the one who guided Lauren. Mike, imagine that, you know, Lauren Michaels is now like the king, right? But you know, yeah, we Herb look at him as a Lauren. suit. We look at him as almost the network. People have this idea of Lorne now, but it was much different in the in the seventies. Exactly. And, you know, there's a lot of talk, you know, when you're talking about SNL, you know, it is this institution, but it's not in a silo. Like there's also NBC and the network and their opinions on what how these things are created. So, you know, Lauren often talks about how Herb was the one who taught him how to deal with the network when you're working on a show yourself and, you know, how network suits, they'll come in and they want to change things. Well, Herb was a great person to deal with, you know, be that in between. So uh, Lauren says when he first got to New York to do Saturday Night Live, he got a call from Herb and they had dinner and they went to 
Elaine's, a restaurant in New York, and there were pictures of Herb on the wall and Elaine from Elaine's Adored Herb. And this is a great introduction for Lauren to New York City. And since he was one of the first people that uh, Lauren knew in New York... Lauren basically opened up to him and said what he was planning on doing. He was going to start the show with NBC. They didn't know what it was going to be called. And then, you know, the next day, Lauren was at his office in New York and Herb calls him up and says, I want to come over to talk to you. And he said, OK, I didn't know what it was about. And then when he got there, he told Lauren he wanted to work on the show with him, which was imagine that kind of nuts. And he basically what Lauren said was, uh, well, the top money that we have for a writer is seven hundred dollars a week. And you are probably way above mm-hmm. our budget. And it was like a late night budget. There was no money. And Earp didn't care. He said this was a great idea and he wanted to work on it with him. So isn't that nuts? Wow. Wow. That Yeah, that's incredible. And it takes people like Herb Sargent to take a shot, I guess, like give something like this, a, a little startup show like that a chance. Like it takes true vision. To take sure. less money, I'm sure he took less money. He wasn't making a scale or whatever like his experience afforded him. I mean, it takes a true visionary like that to spot something in Lauren Michaels and the show and to want to help. That's incredible. That's a really great story. And I think he just believed in Lauren. So he, he basically said, you know, the show was announced a month or two uh, later. But right before that, there was a show called Saturday Night Live with Howard Cosell. And they took the title that SNL wanted to use. So they fell back to NBC's Saturday Night. And the Howard Cosell show was a more expensive version of SNL. They had the budget. They had the ability to hire people. You know, Bill Murray and other you know famous people could go on to that show. So Herb basically, you know helped Lauren through that process when he was really disappointed about that. And Herb came up with the name not ready for primetime players because they didn't really have a name for the cast. So, and, you know, Lauren wasn't sure if that was the right name, but eventually it just stuck. And, uh, you know, every now and then you see not ready for primetime and we still refer to the cast sometimes jokingly that way, but that was Herb Sargent who came up with that name. And I would argue that's the second most iconic thing that Herb Sargent would be involved in coming up with. But we'll, we'll probably, we'll get to that uh, in a few minutes, a little teaser. Before we move on to maybe his, some of his time at the show, do you have any other anecdotes or anything that, that might lead into that? No, I think that's pretty good. I mean, a lot of the, you know, I got to read a lot from a lot of the writers at the time, what they felt of him. Um, you know, I, Alan Zweibel really looked up to Herb Sargent. I mean, he was one of those guys who who just felt the same way, like Tom Davis and Al Franken, that really helped him as well. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I'd love to sort of get to, uh, we sort of have, you, now the listener should have sort of a picture of how and why he was involved with the show. But let's sort of talk about what uh, what he did when he got there and what he helped create. Absolutely. So we set the table. We have this iconic television writer who worked with Steve Allen on The Tonight Show, worked with Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show, was involved with all these great variety shows and TV, took a chance, told Lorne Michaels, I want to work on this show that you're starting. So to set the picture for, for Herb's time at the show, he was a writer on the show for 17 seasons. Between seasons one and seasons 20, he only missed six through eight. But the rest of the time, he was a writer. So he started off as, I think he was called like a writing, he, he, he's basically like one of the, not the head writer, but he's he was like, like a, a supervisor. writing supervisor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he was writing a writing supervisor for the first three seasons. And then seasons four and five, he was head writer. So he took over for Michael O'Donohue. So I want to just get, you know, from your perspective, What's your understanding and perspective of what the job of the head writer is and how can you see their influence on the screen? Sure. Well, you know, I think it's changed over the generations now. I think the head writers are actually much more involved in all of the sketches compared to where they were before. But I think at the time, it was basically this guy was there to help in any way that they can. And I think a lot of people brought their sketches over to Herb to be touched up or like uh, to add a couple things here or there. But I, I think... You know, it was more the fact that, you know, referring to specifically when O'Donohue leaves and then Herb Sargent becomes the the head writer, I think that was more symbolic than anything else because he is the man there. Like he was the the senior presence that it sort of made sense for him in that role. But at the time, you know, Jim Downey, Franklin Davis, like they're growing into their own and they're sort of, you know, uh, Schuster, Marilyn, Suzanne Miller and Beats, they have their own presence on the show. So it was less 
of importance, I would say, his head writing position. But what was more important to me was his influence on Weekend Update, which to me was, you know, his main calling card and what he's probably most remembered for. Right. So he worked along with Chevy Chase. I think he and Chevy worked to really develop Weekend Update. And I don't know, like, talk about the impact that Weekend Update had in terms of shaping SNL's identity in those early years from like your perspective as a viewer and what you know. Well, you know, season one of Saturday Night Live is basically, you know, it's kind of the Chevy Chase show. I mean, you get to know the other cast members. I think they all have their moments in season one, but Chevy is such a star and that shows in terms of the fact that he's going to leave the show pretty soon into season two and get all of these movie roles and for decades is really just a huge star. And Herb Sargent helped make Chevy Chase. Chevy often, you know, credits Herb for being one of the funniest people he's ever met. And to my understanding, when this was originally developed, Weekend Update, they looked at a British show called That Was the Week That Was. That was a 60s British show, and they looked at it, and they were like, okay, this was a really influential show overseas. Obviously, Monty Python had a lot of influence on SNL in general, so there's a lot of British things that have influenced the original days of Saturday Night Live. And, you know, they're going basically to look at what can we do in about a seven-minute span to cover the news of the week. And I think Chevy's version of that was slightly more silly than what we got, But Herb came in and he was like, I want to make this as if it's a real news broadcast. So you see like the formal, you know, news jackets. And it it was just important for Herb Sargent to balance the seriousness of a news broadcast with the satire that Chevy and Jane would eventually bring into the show throughout those first few years. That's one of the things that stood out to me big time, just rewatching uh, SNL episodes from especially season one, is when you see Weekend Update, it's almost like formatted and presented like a news broadcast. Like They wanted to really lean into the parody of a real news broadcast, even to the point where we don't really, we rarely see this now, but they would throw to a reporter covering something live on the scene, often played by like Lorraine Newman. Right now, let's go live to Cape Canaveral, Florida, and correspondent Lorraine Newman. Chevy, this is indeed an historic moment at the Cape. For some years now, scientists and government environmentalists have been trying to come up with a way to get rid of stocks of deadly nerve gases built up monthly by the armed forces. Because of the danger in dumping these chemicals into the sea, NASA has decided to dispose of the materials in outer space. So it was structured like a news broadcast where they would have the anchors there. Then we also have reporters. That's less so throughout the years. Uh, I think they're trying not to portray themselves as like, hey, we're doing the news. They're portraying themselves maybe currently as we're comedians who are riffing on news items. But this isn't necessarily supposed to be presented like a parody of an actual news show. And I don't know if that makes sense, but there was is a difference watching those early seasons, as you mentioned, and that's Herb Sargent. I kind of liked that. I think I, I really enjoyed what Herb Sargent was going for with that presentation. For sure. I think, you know, that's one of the best things about going back and watching old episodes of Saturday Night Live is... Here, let me explain it this way, which is a lot of people don't want to go back and watch old seasons of SNL because they're afraid that they won't get the jokes because it's like, well, this thing that happened in 1975, like I wasn't around for that. So why would I get that? But basically, Herb Sargent and his writing and Chevy's delivery and then eventually Jane and, and Danny and Bill, you know, they put together a weekend update 
that was basically, you know, 200 clippings of stories from the newspapers that were eventually filtered down to being like the most interesting stories. And they explained it in a way that helped you understand what was happening in the news at the same time as they were telling jokes, which I think is a really crucial piece of those first few years of update that eventually, you know, as other personalities on the show in, in decades later, sort of maybe took that out of it a little bit. Like now when you watch Weekend Update, on um, season 48, the assumption is, you know, the story as you're hearing the joke, like you don't hear Colin Jost be like, you know, this week, President Trump went to so and so. And because of that, here's the joke. Instead, they're just like, make a joke about it. And that I think that that's a big difference between what I saw in the early days of the show, which is there was a lot of like helping people understand what was happening in the news. And I think that was helped by Herb creating a realistic news broadcast at the same time. Yeah, I completely agree. It's kind of funny when my wife and I watch SNL. I follow the news a decent amount and my wife's maybe less so. So you're right. They don't set up the joke. They kind of rely on you to understand it. So there's often times where I'm explaining the joke to my wife because she didn't see it in the news that week or anything like that. And uh, I kind of, I guess it's a matter of preference, but I mean, as far as the show is concerned, like in, from your perspective, John, would you rather have like a Herb Sargent style where they set it, they set up the news item and give you a little bit of background and then tell the joke, or, or you know, do you like being in on the joke and not having it to be to be set up for you? I definitely prefer the background. I think that mm -hmm. you know. Uh, like, uh, look, Seth Meyers is the Weekend Update anchor I grew up with, and I think he probably did less of that. And that was right for him in the style and the time. And I think that Colin and Che, you know, like, it's probably right for them to not to just sort of go into the jokes now also. But that's just because of the way the world is, right? Like, it was, you'd watch, like, the 6 o'clock news or the 11 o'clock news, whatever it was, like, in the 70s. And that's where you got your news. But now like your news gets a notification, like something happens in the world, you're getting a notification on your phone right away. So I think like most people are like, with it. So I guess, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. But I think to answer it, I think that like the style was right for the time. And that's what's so brilliant about Saturday Night Live. I definitely agree. Uh, do you have any anecdotes as far as his time on the show? Like what people may maybe said his contributions or anything like that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, first off, obviously, he worked with Chevy a lot. So Chevy was like very fond of him. And then, uh, you know, his influence on a lot of the writers, he ended up, you know, being very responsible for bringing on uh, Davey Wilson, which is the original director of the show. Audrey Pert Dickman was one of the producers of the show. So, you know, a lot of the people who were hired at the same time, he was helped build that cast. And then, you know, after the first few years, he leaves the show along with a lot of the OG people who were at that show. And he'll come back, you know, partway through the Ebersol years to, I think he was working on a show. He was trying to get Jane Curtin to work on a show with him. I'm not sure it worked out, but basically he ends up coming back to the show partway through the Ebersol era and uh, starts to work a little bit on the news. And then I, so I was texting with uh, Gary Kroger, season eight, nine and 10 cast member before. And I said, do you have any interesting Herb Sargent anecdotes for me for this podcast that I'm doing? So Gary says, he says, I may have the best one ever uh, before a Monday. So, you know, Monday meetings, like they'll go into either Lauren or Dick's office and they'll meet the host or whatever. Anyways, so before a Monday meeting in Dick Ebersole's office with the cast and the writers, Dick was very late for the meeting. In those days, Dick wore a big fur coat everywhere he went. OK, <laughs> Dick explained when he got there that he had been mugged in Central Park and Herb leaned over and quietly said, probably a trapper. <laughs> uh, which is so great and sort of like so representative of him like just like smart and on his feet like a great thinker like that so um, that was really great from from Gary and then of course you know there's there's a couple other ones that I think are really interesting and first I'll say so after Lauren comes back and a lot of the original writers are back we get uh, Dennis Miller on Weekend Update who is obviously like great in his own way and, and has his own style and Herb was involved a little bit in sort of getting that going and then Dennis is going to leave the show and they bring on Kevin Nealon to be the Weekend Update anchor. Weekend Update with Kevin Nealon. Good evening. I'm Kevin Harvey Nealon and I'm acting alone. <laughs> Everybody loves Kevin Nealon at the show. 
But Herb is really responsible for sort of getting Kevin to a point where he could do update. And I think what happened was, and you'll hear Jim Downey talk about this a lot on Fly on the Wall, is a lot of people felt that Herb at the time was probably too old fashioned for Kevin Nealon. And the reason that Kevin's update didn't work was because the, a lot of the things that they ended up doing with Norm MacDonald probably should have been done with Kevin Nealon. So there is some good and bad there in terms of the flow overall with, um, you know, how he ended up, you know, being on the show. And I guess by the time we're talking about like seasons, you know, 17 and 18 on the show or whatever it is, I mean, now he's in his 70s, Herb Sargent. So it's like a different vibe as far as like sort of getting what the culture is looking for. And I think that at the time, some of the younger writers who were really with it maybe felt that Herb has, was past his prime at that point. You know about Herb Sargent, what surprised me is when I was looking at the seasons that he was involved with, you know, I was going through each SNL season, looking at the list of the writers. And by the time I got this, like maybe season 16, 17, I was like, holy crap, Herb Sargent is still on the staff. He's by the time season 20 rolls around, Herb Sargent is still at SNL and he's 72 <laughs> by that time. So that, that, that just completely surprised me. And I'm not sure by the end of his, his tenure there, what role he had in the show like do you have any insight maybe not specifically but how his role might have kind of developed over the years yeah i think he was there basically as a as a supervisor um mostly to look over things add jokes like basically what he was back in the day and i think that update you know he still wanted to be involved and he was still involved i believe in norm's update partially but eventually that's went away a little bit but i, I just think it was a respect thing like they really respected him so much and yeah and it was hard to probably move on from somebody that they really felt you know that had helped develop the show in the first place so sometimes these things are really you know hard to do when somebody's there for 20 years yeah, and he seemed really sharp. So at the very least, he sounded like he could punch something up or he could have just a quick kind of witty line to add into something. It seemed like he'd be very good at punching stuff up. And with his experience on SNL and even beforehand, uh, I would think that that would be a great role for somebody like that. Even if he's not sitting there writing sketches from scratch, he's totally valuable in that environment. Yeah, Thomas, do you remember a writer named uh, Steve Corin? Uh, yeah, that does sound familiar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Steve Korn used to work with Sandler and Spade a lot. Uh, also, Molly Shannon really was like very uh, crucial with some of Molly's sketches as well. And Steve Korn was on was a writer on the staff for a very long time. And I read a very interesting story with Steve Korn. Also, by the way, uh, I think he worked with Will Ferrell and Chris Kattan, the Roxbury guys. Like he was just like on a lot of great sketches. But uh, before all of that, before he was even a writer on the show, he tells this great story about Herb Sargent, which I would love to share as a little bit of a final anecdote. So you get a full picture of what Herb was like in even in the 90s. So it was 1990 and Steve Corrin was working as a tour guide at Rockefeller Center. And, you know, he was very excited. Well, you know, Saturday Night Live, loved the show. And he was basically at the time, because he had that in, he knew how to contact Herb Sargent. So he was leaving uh, phone calls on Herb's voicemail saying that he wanted to become a writer. He was sending him writing samples and packets and all the stuff that you would typically hear about somebody who's begging to become a writer. And Steve Corrin was persistent and he never heard back from Herb. So he tried to corner him in person, which is something you probably wouldn't do in 2023. <laughs> but in the 90s, maybe this is something you would do. And as Herb would sometimes leave the building, uh, Steve Corn would walk by him and just say, excuse me, and try and get his attention. And Herb was always polite, but would, you know, kind of walk away and ignore him. And one time, Herb, uh, Herb was even cornered by Steve in an elevator at the building and was like, please just, you know, like, take a look at my stuff. And he gave him sort of like a little bit of a glance. And uh, Steve Corn, you know, said he knew at the time, like, like, it was like a very touchy situation, but he was really hoping that he would take a look at the stuff. Anyways, long story short, uh, a few years later, Marcy Klein, producer for the show, hired Steve Corrin to become a receptionist at Saturday Night Live, you know, out of persistence. And he gets uh, he gets to work there and he's answering phones, but he's really nervous because he had basically been stalking Herb Sargent for a few years. And he was like, if this guy sees me working as a receptionist, he might get me fired. But, you know, he's he's sitting there and, and he remembers, uh, he tells this great story by sitting there and he's wearing like ripped jeans and a stained t-shirt and he just like, you know, didn't have his life together. And he was so worried about this as he's answering Herb's phone calls and sending him stuff. And then eventually Herb Sargent walks past him and Steve thinks 
that he doesn't notice him. And then Herb Sargent says, come into my office. So Steve goes into his office and he's sitting there looking around like amazed by all the pictures on the wall and everything like that. And he says, I want you to know I read some of your writing. It's really good. And wow. he was like dumbfounded that like he remembered him and he read some of his writing and he said, do you work here now? And he's like, yeah, I'm the receptionist. And he's like, you know, some of your writing is really good. And eventually he gets hired to become an update writer and help work with Herb on finding stuff from the newspaper and eventually gets put in a position to write on Saturday Night Live. And he would write for SNL long after Herb was gone. And it's just a great story about like sometimes Gosh. you hear uh, about persistence and connections and stuff like that. And yeah, the world is a little bit different now, but it goes to show you like even with uh, people from different generations, you never know which connections you can make and stuff like that. So a lot of people have great memories of him. And he, like I said, has his footprint all over the show for many generations. Yeah, that's incredible. That just tells me that Herb was gracious to younger writers. You you had mentioned Franken and Davis before that and how he helped them along and Steve Corin right here. And that's I love hearing about that because I don't know if Herb, you know, I don't know if he had mentors that who helped him like he helped others, but it's really nice to hear about people who are successful and don't just thumb their nose at young up and comers like they they want to they want to help and they want to nurture and they spot talent and they want to help that talent grow however they can and i just think that that tells me a lot about a person and just tells me a lot about how gracious herb Sargent was and probably i mean there's many good reasons but you said that there's a, a prestigious award named after herb Sargent. what can you remind us what what that award is again yeah, so this is the Herb Sargent Award for Comedy Excellence. And there is a lot of people who have won this award, including Lorne Michaels himself, as well as Tina Fey, uh, Robert Carlock, a great SNL writer. Uh, Judd Apatow won this, James L. Brooks as well. And if you go and you Google Herb Sargent's name, you know, this is going to be the first thing that comes up with all the people who talk about, you know, this award and, you know, what it means to win an award named after him as being one of the greats, the original comedy writer. So, like I said, I mean, uh, just to win this award and, and to know how many people he's influenced must be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And Herb Sargent, so he passed away uh, in May of 2005. And uh, finally tonight, on a serious note, Weekend Update founding editor Herb Sargent passed away this week. Uh, here he is with Chevy Chase back in the day. All of us will miss you very much, Herb. We wouldn't be here without you. Uh, he would actually be... 99 right now in july uh of 2023 he would he would be 100 so yeah i mean he's totally respected not just in snl but in uh television and in writing in general so um i guess john before we wrap this up is there anything else that that you want to share about herb yeah i mean look i want to go back to the original discussion that we started talking about at the beginning of the show, which is, you know, what do you value when you're voting for the SNL Hall of Fame? And I think that if you really appreciate Saturday Night Live, you need to appreciate some of the writers that helped influence the show. I think there's potentially no writer more influential than Herb Sargent, because not only did he influence the cast members that appeared on the show, but he influenced every writer that came after him and started with him, really. So I think that if we're going to do things right here, I think that Herb Sargent has to get into the Hall of Fame. Will he get in this time? I don't know. But I would vouch that eventually he does get in because he totally deserves it. If there is an award named after him that SNL Hall of Famer Tina Fey herself has won, and <laughs> then we have to basically consider putting him in the SNL Hall of Fame. So I was just really touched that I got to talk about somebody who's meant so much to the institution that we get to cover. <laughs> So there's that interesting position taken by Mr. Schneider there uh, as he implores listeners and voters to think of the institution of Saturday Night Live when voting. And I, I think that I couldn't agree with that more. Uh, you know, there is a, a an absolute um, misallocation of writers so far that uh, have been inducted into the Hall of Fame. And there's a glut 
you know, that is is just sitting there around 40s and 50s uh, in the percentage point. They need to be, be taken over the top and and elected to the Hall of Fame. Uh, quite frankly, um, now you you may disagree, but some of these writers are absolutely influential, uh, and there would be no show, you know, without without them. So consider that when voting. But for now, let's go to the uh, the Hall of Fame sketch. And in this case, the sketch that has been selected by Thomas and John is uh, the very first episode of Weekend Update, um, which is a, an interesting choice because Sergeant would have been uh, had his fingerprints all over this. And um, this is the you know the, the the most creative way to sort of showcase what he's got to offer. So let's uh, go right to that sketch now, and um, I'll meet you on the other side. Weekend update with Chevy Chase. Good evening, I'm Chevy Chase. Our top story tonight, dedication ceremonies for the new Teamsters Union headquarters building took place today in Detroit, where Union President Fitzsimmons is reported to have said that former President Jimmy Hoffa will always be a cornerstone in the organization. <laughs> now, world leaders in the news. Japan Emperor Hirohito met Mickey Mouse at Disneyland this week. The Emperor presented Mickey with a Hirohito wristwatch. <laughs> Dateline Washington. At a press conference Thursday night, President Ford blew his nose. Alert Secret Service agent seized his handkerchief and wrestled it to the ground. <laughs> and yesterday in Washington, President Ford bumped his head three times getting into his helicopter. The CIA immediately denied reports that it had deliberately lowered the top of the doorway. <laughs> Mr. Ford was on the campaign trail announcing in Detroit that he has written his own campaign slogan. The slogan, if he's so dumb, how come he's president? <laughs> the post office announced today... Just a second, I lost my place. Oh, the post office announced today that it is going to issue a stamp commemorating prostitution in the United States. It's a 10 cent stamp, but if you want to lick it, it's a quarter. <laughs> Murder at the Blaine Hotel again. For a live report, let's go to Lorraine Newman in Midtown Manhattan at the Blaine Hotel. Lorraine? Chevy, I'm standing outside a room on the 15th floor of the Blaine Hotel, where number 38 in a series of grisly and bizarre murders has occurred just over an hour ago. The motive again, murder, as it has been in the previous 37 slashings. In a fit of pique, the mayor has called the Blaine Hotel a pockmark on the neck of Midtown Manhattan. Once again, grisly death and murder in the Blaine Hotel. Lorraine Newman reporting. Still to come, earthquake claims San Diego, four million die in Turkey, and Arlene visits an art museum. <laughs> Guests on NBC Saturday night stay at the fabulous Blaine Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. The Blaine, a tradition for more than half a century. Our final story tonight concerns the birth of a baby sandpiper at the Washington Zoo. It's the first such birth of, in captivity on record. The baby chick made its debut at 9.18 this morning, weighing at just under 14 grams, and according to zoo officials, resembled its mother quite closely. And the name given our fuzzy little friend, simply Pip. One humorous note, the bird was stepped on and crushed to death this afternoon by Goggles, the baby hippo born in captivity last Wednesday. Well... That's the news this evening. This is Chevy Chase. Good night and have a pleasant tomorrow. All right. That was Weekend Update, the very first edition of Weekend Update. So very historical there. Sounds similar to what we deal with, you know, in terms of Weekend Update today. But it's dated. It's, it's, it's different. It's, it's they're figuring things out. But we, we chose that sketch Ultimately, because it did have Sergeant's fingerprints all over it, and um, it, it's a good way to sort of showcase what he brings to the table. I want to thank John Schneider. If you're not uh, checking out the Saturday Night Network, you're doing it wrong. 
So we'll just say that, uh, obviously, I want to thank my colleagues, Matt and Thomas. They are wonderful. And um, that's what I've got for you this week. So if you would please do me a favor and on your way out, as you walk past the weekend update exhibit, turn out the lights because the SNL Hall of Fame is now closed. Thanks for listening to the SNL Hall of Fame podcast. Make sure to rate, review, share, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media at SNLHOF. This is Doug Denant saying, this is Doug Denant saying, see you next week. Podcasts and such. It's Spring Black Friday at the Home Depot, which means it's time to get your outdoor spaces ready so you can enjoy more this season. Right now, you can get the Stylewell Park Point four-piece patio set at a new lower price of $3.99. With its stain-resistant cushions and modern relaxed styling, it's the perfect centerpiece for your porch, deck, or patio, whether you're looking for sunny lounging or evening gathering. Hurry into the Home Depot to get the Stylewell Park Point patio set at a new lower price, just $3.99. Shop Spring Black Friday savings at the Home Depot. How doers get more done.